Well, the clock has struck two here in Chicago, so we are going to get started with crafting your next chapter's information session. It is February 14th, Valentine's Day, so I hope all of you are enjoying it. My name is Seth Green, and on an afternoon like this one, I'm especially grateful to say I'm the Dean here at the University of Chicago Graham School. And welcome to our gorgeous campus where the big ideas of this university are born. And welcome to this information session where we will briefly introduce the Graham School, why we started on this Crafting Your Next Chapter journey. And then I'm gonna turn it over to our instructors for a snapshot. And then we're gonna talk about the application process and welcome your questions. So let me start for those of you who are not familiar with a welcome to the Graham School. We are the destination for lifelong learners and leaders who are seeking to better understand the world and live examined lives of purpose. And we have been at this mission now since the university's founding in 1890 uh, for more than 130 years. And today, what that looks like is programs across the liberal arts. We have a master of liberal arts that is among the most respected and rigorous in the world. We have a four year great book certificate program called the basic program of liberal education. And then every quarter, we have about 70 courses across all disciplines of the university where you can dive in to the lifelong liberal arts. And just in the last few years, we've added this world of life navigation and leadership because so many of the people that were coming for intellectual discernment were saying, I'm really eager to look at my life. And many of these individuals are 50 plus, and they're thinking about this in a both intellectual and practical sense. And we've begun looking at how do we build out programs that really develop the knowledge, skills, and networks to lead effectively in this next chapter of life. And so with that, I want to talk a little bit about why we started crafting your next chapter before turning it over to the instructors that are here with us today. And there's really a twofold rationale behind this program and some of the others that we've been putting out as a school. The first is that people are living longer. And while there's unfortunately a significant inequity in the United States such that life expectancy on average has only moved a little bit in the last couple decades, if you look at people that are educated at a certain level, that has been a huge growth place in life expectancy. And so for many of the people that find their ways to the university and to Graham's doors, we are increasingly seeing individuals who are living into their 90s or hundreds and who, when they get to 60, are looking out at a whole new chapter of life reliably. And they are saying, what do I want to do with this newfound time and this whole new structure of adulthood? The second piece is that we have seen a lot of big issues in society that really could leverage the leadership and involvement of these individuals. And we've said, how do we potentially activate this group toward a meaningful next chapter that could have impact on these issues? And so as we looked at these topics together, we realized there was a large need for us to be thinking about helping individuals on their life navigation. And so almost two years ago, we brought together 250 eminent scholars, distinguished practitioners, and accomplished executives in areas from healthy aging to wellness. And what we looked at was how can we develop really valuable programs that will make a difference in individuals' lives and that will add value at a societal level. These are some of the people that we brought together for that gathering. And the outcome was that we began working on two different initiatives that we consider bookends of this life navigation moment. The first is an initiative called Leadership and Society Initiative, uh, which I'll put in the chat in a moment, which is the really deep effort for people that have kind of completed their longstanding careers and who want to spend an entire year at the University of Chicago in residence looking at how they can know themselves better, how they can positively impact the world and how they can envision a new chapter of impact. And that ends with a purpose plan that is a really extensive and comprehensive plan for one's future. So if that is the very deep 
an entirely comprehensive answer to this question of how do I develop my next chapter. We also wanted to have the ability for people who wanted to get started on this journey in a meaningful way. And with that in mind, we developed Crafting Your Next Chapter. And that is a program that is focused especially on individuals who are mid to late career and who are looking forward to that next chapter and want to begin planning it before they reach that point of retirement. They also are in a place where they really want to engage in deep, rigorous, and respectful open exchange, and they have an eagerness to develop a vision for their next chapter that is kind of blending these themes of wellness and how they have a meaningful legacy in society. With that, I want to turn it over to the leaders of Crafting Your Next Chapter, Russ Eisenstadt and Stephanie Eisenstadt. They're going to talk about the vision and the curriculum for the program. And then after they speak, I'll come back with a little bit of the logistics in terms of both the program and the application process. I should say before introducing them that Russ and Stephanie are extremely accomplished and we feel very lucky to have them teaching at the Graham School. Uh, Russ is someone who has pioneered new practices and perspectives that enable leaders to realize their highest aspirations for contribution, meaning, and satisfaction for themselves and those that they lead. He has served as a coach and catalytic thought partner to senior leaders across a wide range of organizations in the private and social sectors. He is co-founder, as you can see on the screen in front of you, of Rising Path Partners, whose mission is to support individuals in successfully navigating major transitions in their work and lives. He received his PhD in clinical psychology from Yale, spent years in the faculty of the Harvard Business School in leadership and organizational behavior. He's the founding executive director of the Higher Ambition Leadership Alliance, as well as the founding president of TruePoint, a mission-driven organizational consulting firm. He has authored many articles and path-breaking books, including Higher Ambition, How Great Leaders Create Economic and Social Value, and The Critical Path to Corporate Renewal. Stephanie Eisenstadt is similarly accomplished. She is a certified coach, practicing clinician, and physician educator that has helped individuals and groups enhance their effectiveness and impact for over 30 years. She has helped a wide range of leaders navigate their way through work-life transitions, use their voices, talents, and strengths to create win-win solutions to complex problems, and translate vision into action in times of stress and transition. She is also a co-founder of Rising Path Partners and is a practicing internist at Mass General, an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School, and she has been an academic leader in women's health, chronic care management, and interdisciplinary care redesign, and is similarly the author of major books and articles, including The Primary Care of Women and The Harvard Guide to Women's Health. Uh, before I turn it over to them, I will just say that I'm not the only one who's a huge fan. We did have one of these cohorts in the autumn, and that cohort was also a huge fan. I had the joy of reading the surveys that came back. And these are just some of the comments that I read in the anonymous surveys, uh, people that have great admiration for Russ and Stephanie that talk about how they really learned how to celebrate the successes, however small, and that this gave them a whole new perspective on this moment of life. Individuals who really talked about how meaningful it was to come together with people from all walks of life who are at a similar stage vis-a-vis -vis thinking about next steps and how it ultimately led them to a whole new way to approach, in this person's case, their late 50s and decide where to spend time. And finally, someone who calls them an amazing duo, it was so intense that I'm in a bit of a funk for not having it on my calendar anymore. And so with that, uh, Russ and Stephanie, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm eager alongside our audience here to dive into the curriculum that you've put together for this cohort. Well, well thank you, Seth. Um, let me see if I can, this is the, the challenging part is to, to make the screen share work. Uh, everybody can see the, uh, see, yeah, video, perfect. So happy Valentine's Day to all. And um, it really is a, a pleasure to be, uh, for Stephanie and I to be sharing uh, this hour with all of you. Um, you know, I can't tell you just what an incredibly 
uh, uplifting experience it has been to be working with Seth and and um, the Graham School, teaching this course in the fall, um, and really just partnering with a set of of you know remarkable people in terms of craft helping them and partnering with them around uh, crafting their next chapter. So um, what we'd like to do over the next uh, few minutes is just to create some space, spend some time. Uh, really setting the stage, um, giving you a sense of kind of the core content and and frame that we'll be covering in in the program, and then um, and and then dive into the course itself. Um, really give you more of a sneak preview. Um, we'll have time at the end for Q and A. So, uh, but as you go through, you know, please feel free to use the chat um, to. Uh, ask questions, and we'll keep track of that, and then come back to those um, as we get get towards the end. So, um, you know, this whole question of the next chapter, I, I wanted to start um, a little bit more personally. Um, as Seth Seth highlighted, um, I spent uh, the the decade from uh, age fifty five to sixty five uh, founding and. Uh, and being the, the inaugural executive director for a nonprofit for purpose and values driven CEOs and, and companies. And uh, that was an absolute, we did that for a decade and it was a very deeply gratifying and, and, and successful chapter in my life. Um, I reached 65 and I said, you know, <laughs> this was terrific. Um, and, but it feels like it's time to start stretching some different muscles and doing some different things. And um, as the clock ticked down towards my 65th birthday, um, I started getting these really interesting comments from people. Um, how does it feel to be approaching the social security years? How's your health holding out? What are you doing with all that room that the kids are out of the house? Are you guys gonna be moving to Florida anytime soon? Have you taken up golf yet? I definitely am not a golfer. Miniature golf, maybe, but but not golf. Um, and and when are you going to retire? And you know, I have to tell you that none of these questions at all resonated for me. Um, you know, I was in a place in my life where I didn't want to do what I'd been doing, but I certainly didn't want to be re retiring either. Um, it's really asking a very different set of questions, Stephanie. Um, was in a similar place in terms of her medical career. Um, and we found ourselves asking some very different questions, which really were the or and which were really the origins of this program, especially as we saw how many of the people that we knew our professional colleagues as well were asking very similar questions. Um, and the questions that really came to mind for us were, you know, can we aspire to something other than just getting older? Um, at this stage of the game, how do we fully leverage our capabilities and talents? How do we find meaning and purpose in this next chapter in our work and lives? And those were just very, very, very different questions than kind of conventionally. I think the, the kinds of questions we were being asked or that people, you know, ha have thought about when, as they reach that point in their lives. And as we thought about, you know, the, answering those questions, you know, certainly for myself, um, I, I found that, you know, I looked to some of the some of the models in my own life. And and, you know, I have to say, when I looked at those models, um, what, what I found was um, examples that really weren't very helpful for me. This is a, a picture of my uh, my grandfather, Sam, and, and his wife, uh, Betsy, uh, Bessie. They, this was in the. The Catskills, or as it was known by many in New York, the Borscht Belt. Um, you, you know, for Sam, when he reached 65, he'd worked his whole life. He'd been a paper boy. Um, he'd worked in a factory. He was totally exhausted, and he truly, truly wanted to be retiring. It was time. Um, it, it, it that really what a traditional retirement was the right thing for him. But that clearly was a different generation and certainly not, not right for me. Um, fortunately, and I think interestingly, uh, Stephanie had a different experience in terms of, in terms of her model. And Steph, do you wanna say something about a, a, your, your grandmother and, and your experience? 
Yeah, th thanks, Ross, and welcome everybody. We have an, a wonderfully a large crowd here. It's wonderful to see everybody. So uh, yeah, for me, Nancy, my grandmother, uh, chose a very interesting path. Her husband had died when she was age 60, so she really had to rethink her life. She was an artist who throughout her life loved art and travel, and she found that at this transition point in her life that she could connect the two, and that would be meaningful and deeply satisfying. So here she is actually on an archeologic dig that she went on her own to Tanzania, Africa. And then she decided to live with the Maasai tribe in Kenya and Tanzania for three months. She used the experience to create her art and serigraphs. And she enjoyed this and, and diving deep into other cultures so much that she continued to do this, living in different countries for periods of time around the world, creating art based on those experiences, quite brave and uh, different from a lot of other uh, women in her generation. My father, Philip, had a much more traditional road to retirement. He was an organic chemist and he worked in R&D for a division of a very large corporation that had mandatory retirement at age 65, whether you were ready or not. He had no choice. And he struggled with this, actually, for many years when his work came to an abrupt end. So we know now that the uh, average age of retirement in the US for all workers has been rising. It's from, used to be around age 57, now it's about age 62. For physicians, we've tradi traditionally retired much later, on average closer to age 68. And for a lot of us, we work till the end of our lives. But now post COVID, the average age of retirement actually is now around 65. So overall, we're living longer lives, we're living healthier lives, but our life is not forever. And so this sort of rewirement and retirement are taking on a whole new meaning now. And we now have a unique opportunity to think uh, more creatively about uh, the next chapter. Russ? Yeah, thank, thank you, Stephanie. And, you know, we share, just share some of these examples because, you know, again, you may want to think about in your own life, you know, who who, who are the models for you, the the people, um, the examples that you have about what this this phase and chapter of your life looks like, um, and those models and exemplars are 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 really quite powerful, um, and you know, this really reinforces, in some sense, a deeper point about mindset. And, and approach. So, you know, this is a classic um, gestalt picture. And, you know, the question is, what do you see? So is this a, is this a, a young woman or um, and, 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 and a, a very old woman? And again, you know, depending on how you look at it, it's, it's really both of those. Um, but depending on what that frame, um, it deeply, deeply influences how you think about the world. Perception becomes reality. And our mindset about aging shapes how we see and react to the world. So again, you know, as you think for yourself and you imagine your own future years unfolding, how are you thinking about it? You know, in what way are you seeing it as an opportunity for renewal and reinvention? Or is it a, or, or very much, you know, the more traditional view of this as being, you know, essentially the beginning of a slow and, and steady decline? Um, and you may want to just sort of think about some of the models and the images um, for yourself that you've grown up with, um, whether your parents, your professional colleagues, friends, um, what's on the, per the popular press and TV as you think about, you know, the images of getting older and what resonates and what doesn't um, for yourself. And, and that's an area I think is, is helpful to reflect on and really think about where you are in relationship to that. Um, a lot of this program is, is truly an opportunity for people to exercise a very different level of agency about their life, to go past the stereotypes and the, and, and, and the models they've been given and, and truly make a choice uh, for themselves about how they want to live this chapter. So it's not surprising that a lot of us um, have a traditional view of, of the, our, the latter part of our lives. Uh, most of us grew up with this very simple three-stage model of life, you know, where they're in childhood and adolescence, there's this period of, of rapid growth and learning and college and so on. And then you, you graduate from college or graduate school, and then there's this long plateau 
Um, and then you sort of hit 65 and it's almost like falling off a cliff and you go into retirement. And again, you know, you have this period of decline and it's, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. You know, it's an awful lot um, uh, th that really describes most of the lives that we've all been, um, th th how we've all been raised. Um, and, and by the way, this it's not surprising that we this is deeply embedded in us. It, it really goes all the way back. I um, wanted to share with you, some of you may know the riddle of the Sphinx, uh, which goes back to ancient Greece. Uh, the, the riddle is said to be that the Sphinx um, was barring the, the, the path to Delphi and asked Oedipus what walks on four legs in the morning. Uh, two legs at noon and three legs in the evening. Um, and he had to answer the riddle correctly to pass, or if not, uh, the Sphinx would uh, would eat him. And, and as some of you may know, uh, the answer is, of course, a human being. Um, that as a baby, we walk on four. As an adult, uh, we walk on two legs. And, and, and as we get older, uh, we walk with a cane and three legs and so on. So again, that three pay, that three stage uh, view of life. Um, and as Seth pointed out in, in the intro, uh, it's not surprising that we had that view of life. If you look at life expectancy, I mean, it's truly remarkable that that our lifespans have have actually doubled um, since the since the the mid 1800s. And even in our lifetime, um, they've they've gone up uh, by by ten years from seventy to eighty. So we really are living in a very very different space. Um, and this is not just a quantitative difference; it's really a qualitative difference. There's this. I think uh, Mary Catherine Bateson has a wonderful um, uh, wonderful insight. This was Margaret Mead's daughter. Uh, she says we have not added decades to life expectancy by simply extending old age. Instead, we have opened up the new space partway through the life course, a second and different kind of adulthood that precedes old age. And as a result, every stage of life is undergoing change. So this isn't just about, about more years, it's really about fundamentally rethinking about what our lives are about. Um, and there are a number of researchers that have really been converging on this very different view, as opposed to the idea of a three-stage life, thinking about at least two additional stages that, you know, as if as Seth highlighted, as people are living into their 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, that's not just affecting us later on in life, but um, early, in early career, in terms of setting the course for um, our our kids' generation, you know, the folks in in their um, 20s and, and early 30s. Um, people are getting married later. They're settling on their final careers at a later point, having children at a later point. And so there is this extended period of exploration in that stage. As, as our youngest child put it, Dad, we're, I'm on a voyage of discovery <laughs> and, and, and exploring things in a way far longer than was certainly true for, for our generation. And then there's the second stage, 50 to 75, which Stephanie liked to call uh, rewirement, which you can almost think of as a second adulthood. And that's, that's the focus of the program that we're going to be teaching um, and what we're talking about today. And as you think about that period, that second path, half of life, it's a period both of freedom, and I think part of what we heard from the people in the program is that there really is a sense of liberation. That you know, as as if if you have children, those children are often going out into the world. Um, you have often many of us have more um, degrees of freedom uh, professionally in terms of what what we're going to be doing. We're at a stage of life where we really can be making choices, but it's also a period of fragility um, and a realization that this isn't forever. Um, you know, the averages are that people are living longer, but but sadly, I think very few of us reach this point in life without uh, knowing some having a brush. Uh, with mortality, uh, whether that's from parents or friends or family or, or dealing with our own health. Um, and 
what we find and what we found in the program is that there are really different issues and opportunities, kind of two phases um, to the second half. One is that period before uh, you leave full-time employment. Um, for the folks who are in the program, um, who, who were at that stage, really the challenge is around renewal, um, around feeling um, that you're not retiring in place, that you're continuing to grow, develop, and contribute in new ways, revitalization, starting to rebalance, thinking not just about work, but the other parts of your life, and thinking about how do you start to transition to that next generation, moving more in mentorship roles, thinking about more about legacy. Um, for the folks in the program who were um, really had taken the plunge or thinking about taking the plunge from leaving full-time employment, um, the, the issues, there are really sort of three core issues that people, people grapple, we find people grappling with. One is just around identity. You know, if I've been deeply involved in my work over the years, kind of who am I if I don't have that um, business card or I don't have that email that, you know, describes kind of who I am and what I do. What do I say at, you know, a cocktail party when people are asking me uh, what I'm doing? Where do I find my sense of purpose? For so many of us, so much of our sense of purpose and contribution um, and meaning in life comes from our professional roles. And, and finally, community. Um, that again, a great deal of our, um, our the people that we've connected to in our relationships are so uh, interwoven with work. Um, when our kids are growing up, you know, we get involved in the PTA and and so many of the things, those community things, are sort of age related. And so now, um, you know, suddenly I'm not working full time. How do I feel? Continue to feel feel connected. Um, and so those are some of the challenges. Um, but there's also um, a whole set of resources that we bring to bear. And I think one of the things that I think is really quite exciting is the research that really shows that there is an increase in what's called crystallized intelligence as we get older, our ability to spot patterns to, um, to our emotional intelligence, our ability to really navigate our way through complicated waters in, 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 in more powerful ways than we might have in the past. So that's really the opportunity. Um, and so I'm gonna skip through this and, 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 and really say, look, you know, as we think about midlife, um, it isn't just a time of crisis, it really is a time of opportunity. Interestingly, um, there's a very well-known and robust finding that shows that if you look at life satisfaction, um, it, it's, it, 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 it's like a U. That, um, at age 50 is really the trough, and then after that, there is an opportunity for things to, to, to in fact, uh, move forward. And in fact, people do get happier over time um, and even into their 90s. And truly the opportunity in a program like this is to take advantage of that and catch that rising that rising curve. And so I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie in just a second, but um, I, I, I wanted to highlight that again, truly, um, I think for, 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 for all of us in many ways, the best is yet to come. And there are a lot of wonderful examples of this. Uh, this is a, a late self-portrait by uh, Rembrandt. Um, he really did, I think many people feel myself included. He did some of his greatest work in his 60s, some of his most deeply psychological and self-revealing. Um, for those of you who are interested in, in, in art history, a more recent example um, is Henry Matisse. Um, it was really remarkable when he hit his 80s um, his vision was going, um, he couldn't hold a, a um, paintbrush, um, but he, he could cut out paper. And so he created these remarkable cutouts in his 80s and 90s, which were truly um, a whole second uh, renaissance in terms of uh, his art. Uh, and more close to home and more recently, um, the immortal uh, Mick Jagger, um, who at age 80 is still going strong and um, 
uh, is continuing to give concerts. And if you're interested, he's um, going to be playing in Foxborough at the end of May. So um, again, I think there's hope for all of us as we uh, move forward into this next chapter. And so that's very much, uh, let me turn it over to Stephanie and talk to talk more specifically about the program and 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 the platform it creates for for um, each of you um, to launch into this exciting stage. Steph, over to you. Thanks. How about we go to the next slide, Russ? Well, so for the past three years, we've been teaching a course called Crafting Your Next Chapter, and we're trying to nurture your inner growth mindset and unleash a much more creative approach to designing your next chapter. The program was initially developed at Massachusetts General Hospital, or MGH as we refer to it, in Boston in 2021 for senior physicians and researchers. And since 2023, we have taught it at the University of Chicago Graham School to reach a much broader audience. And the next course uh, here starts March 5th and runs through June 11th. And the course is virtual using a Zoom platform. So uh, why do this? Why sign up for this? Well, first and foremost, people taking the course uh, reported back to us that taking this course really helped them to turn aspiration, uh, okay, maybe even uh, some dread into action and actually help them to identify new sources of meaning and purpose. There is a focus in the course on identifying your second adulthood and what's most important to you and learning new ways to leverage your skills and talents and desires now for continued satisfaction and impact. Many of us have been finding that relationships are changing with family, significant others, friends, and, and our larger work and social network. And this course can help one think about how to evolve work and life that is in harmony with a rich and fulfilling social network and community. What are those new conversations? Learning how to let go and what does that mean? And perhaps learning how to uh, get out of one's comfort zone. Some people taking the course focused on strategies to preserve health and to integrate ways to decrease stress. And we know for some that work as it's structured currently is not does not always help with this. And aspects of the course helped in achieving that better work-life balance using the power of community. And finally, wouldn't it be just great if we were figuring out new ways just to have fun and to build more joy into our lives? And through the course, interestingly enough, many people discovered new parts of themselves, ways, ways to stretch new muscles, and explore new, new sources for joy and satisfaction. So what are the, some of the special advantages of, this, of a course like this in its design? Well, for one, it's through the wonderful University of Chicago and all the resources a great university like this offers, everything to make the experience really good for you. But more generally, people report, this is a safe and trusted environment to discuss a transition process there is a fear that if one talks about transition, especially at work, that it might be misinterpreted and one might be marginalized or passed over for opportunities. Research tells us that most people want to kind of rewire or retire gradually rather than stopping suddenly and that the process we use in the course allows to think about uh, that. Work is, well, uh, work and it's difficult when the culture that we live in favors work and leaving leaves limited time for us to think or plan for a next chapter. So a course like this can help. And then, you know, these are really tough transitions. They can involve transitioning leadership opportunities and positions, quickly feeling a loss of identity and purpose and, and one's core identity. And we want to avoid feeling like we're quickly falling into an abyss. There needs to be resources and options for the pre, peri, and post uh, retirement at our home base. And this is a platform where har harnessing the, pow the power of group and community can really help And we, we, as we think about what resources we need to seek and to ask for during this kind of transition. And don't underestimate the emotional part of this. There is a letting go process 
And it helps to have support for this. For instance, help in imagining new ways of relating to people who've been part of your community for such a long time or getting more comfortable with uncertainty and the unknown. Our lives may not be as prescribed as they were before. And then determining the right time for transition. But uh, back to the course and the logistics, because I see there's actually a lot of questions about that in the chat. So participants from the course have been really enthusiastic. Uh, we, we've been doing evaluation survey and 100% reported back that they would recommend this course to someone else. And the overall rating was 4.7 out of five. We have used their real-time feedback for our own course quality improvement. The course is set up as eight virtual sessions and 120 minutes each every other week with an about an hour to an hour and a half preparation for each session in between. And it's designed as a guided journey grounded in the latest research in lifespan development, positive psychology and organizational psychology, areas that Russ and I are deeply involved with. And it involves self-reflective exercises, provocative readings, an organized course guidebook with relevant resources that draw from the literature, large and small group discussion, peer-to-peer -peer support in what we call progress partners, individual coaching, and an opportunity to join a post-course alumni community. And we purposely keep the class small to less than 20 for participants, and we've even taken advantage of the in-between time between, between the weeks for optional office hours and virtual social gatherings and guest speakers. So Russ, the next slide. So as an action learning course, it's not just about the materials or the evidence-based literature, and it's certainly not a standard lecture course. It's about harnessing the power of group and community Active participation and well-facilitated group processes are key to its success. And participants report many benefits, for, but especially around the power of trusted community in decreasing that ambivalence about our life choices and feeling a lot more energized about the journey going forward. So, you know, Seth went through some of the feedback, but just to highlight a few, one participant said, it's, it created a safe space for colleagues to share vulnerabilities, challenges, and successes. Another one said, the course is invaluable to me in identifying where I'm heading and what's most important to me as I approach my late 50s and decide where I want to spend my time. And another said, the course gave me the time and permission to reflect in a semi-structured manner with insightful leadership in a way that allowed me to identify uh, next steps. Next slide, Russ. So what is that evidence-based approach? Well, first it's about reflecting, reframing, taking the time to be more intentional on where you're at now and then reframe, which means understanding the components of aging well, adopting a learning growth mindset and developing strategies for opening that aperture. The next is to an opportunity to recess, redesign and take first action steps to revitalize your current work and life, recharge, clear out that underbrush and strategize on ways to really negotiate roles. And then the third part is to help identify where the more fundamental reinvention is needed through a set of visioning exercises, drafting a plan and making pivotal, pivotal choices that strengthen, that builds and leverages your strengths and keeps you moving forward. Russ, the next slide. The process also involves some cognitive rethinking of our assumptions, sometimes imposed by us with our personal history and experience, other times through culture and our own socialization and life history and circumstances. For instance, going from thinking that decisions need to be all or none, that there's nothing in between. Rather, can we really think about how do we dial up or dial down? And we often uh, need to come to think we need to come to some big decision that there's some epi epiphany or big change, but rather we can start with where we are now and design uh, small steps, learn as we go, create these new habits and revitalize before reinventing. There's also an assumption that we need to figure this out all on our own and that can feel quite lonely and isolated, but we don't have to think like that. We can engage the power of group and community and we often focus on what's not working. And, and you know, I, I, I do this as well. It's protective. 
but we can also move to savoring what's positive and actually pointing out what's positive and leveraging the positive, the highs and the small wins, and learning from the lows while building on our strengths. And this is not necessarily a time of inevitable decline. It, it can be the best maybe to come uh, yet. And all this sounds incredibly simple, but it's just not uh, that easy. Uh, Russ, over to you in the next slide. Yeah, so as Stephanie highlighted, you know, part of what the course is, is really an opportunity for um, kind of guided and structured self-reflection and asking the right questions and in, in, in the right order. Um, one of the core frameworks that we developed for the program that we found very powerful is what we call the compass. And these four dimensions um, have been found by previous research uh, to be related both to, to um, long-term life satisfaction, to health, um, to all kinds of positive outcomes. And, you know, sim simply mean, mean, thinking about what one's level of meaning and purpose in terms of being an, as a North Star, the quality of relationships, um, the sense of joy in life, as Stephanie highlighted, and health, both in terms of mind, body, and spirit. And Part of what we discover, I think a very common theme in the course is people talk about, you know, gosh, I've been so focused. Um, meaning and purpose is wonderful, I've, but I've been so focused on that and had one view of how I create meaning in life. How, how do I think about other sources of meaning? Um, how do I think about that meaning perhaps shifting more from the for-profit to the nonprofit sector? And how do I create a greater sense of balance in terms of my relationships and joy and, and, and giving myself permission, in fact, um, to have some fun in my life and taking care of my health in, in ways that I might have before? Um, and you may want to think about just even for yourself, sort of jotting down and sort of doing your own self-assessment on kind of wh wh where are you on that compass and, and on those dimensions. And, you know, we find that to be just a, a, an enormously helpful way of sort of t taking stock and, 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 and calibrating. Um, in the program, you know, we, as part of, Stephanie highlighted the guidebook, there's a very detailed guidebook that accompanies the, the course with a set of exercises. This is the, the drill down on the, on the compass. And as you'll see, there are a set of questions around each of those dimensions, create an opportunity for you to, to think about the pluses and minuses, what's working on each of those dimensions of your life uh, and where are the opportunities for um, potential, potential improvement. Um, and so again, back to sort of taking taking charge of your life. Um, a second kind of key area, you know, as we start thinking about in, in revitalization that we find to be particularly powerful um, is really creating the space to clear out the underbrush that, you know, there's just a lot of clutter <laughs> we find. It, part of it is, you know, physical clutter, but also just in terms of activities and the things that we make commitments to. And in terms of creating the space to truly take on some new dimensions, thinking about the things that have really um, earned, earned their right to be a part of the, the life that you want to be leading. Um, and so we have people in the program think about, to simply, it's very simple exercise you can think about doing for yourself, listing all the things that you're involved in and asking yourself, how energizing are each of those really for you? How meaningful are each of those? And, and, and what are the implications for that? What are the things that are truly energizing and meaningful that you want to do more of? or those that you want to be doing, and, and those that may be less so, that you want to do less of, or, or not at all, or approach in a different kind of way. Um, and then finally, you know, as we get towards the, the move on in the course, we really challenge you to ask some pretty fundamental questions about your life. Um, what is it that, as you reflect on your life and what's working now, um, and, and, and what you want to change, what do you want to preserve and build on? And what would you hope would be different? Are there paths not taken in your life that you want to more fully explore in, in this next chapter? Um, I think that's one of those golden opportunities. Often people just simply um, continue uh, based on the momentum of what they've done as opposed to taking a deep breath and saying, 
How can I exercise some, some new muscles? What are the non-negotiables, the things that absolutely need to be there? And then finally, um, if you had no constraints, what would you be doing? Really, we challenge you to dream, right? To really think about what's possible to think outside of the box. So I wanna end um, in, before turning it back over to, to Seth uh, with one of Stephanie and my uh, really favorite quotes um, from Mary Oliver, um, which is really around crafting your next chapter and, and a question for each of you. And I think to the core of, of, of the territory that we explore in the program, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Each of us only has one. Uh, very precious. And I think what's so special for us about teaching this course is it's really an opportunity to answer that question for yourself. Uh, Seth, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Russ. And I'm going to be brief because we do want to get to Q&A with you. And I'm going to just share my screen again. There we go. Uh, and I am now going to walk us through briefly the process ahead for those of you who have been engaged by Russ and Stephanie and who may want to be in the spring cohort. Uh, the next step for you is to fill out the application. And it already came up in the chat, uh, how do you select? And so I want to be clear that this is a selective process because at least for the first cohort, we received many more candidates than we were able to put into the cohort. But it was not what you might consider to be the typical U Chicago selection process. There were no GPAs considered, and uh, it is not about your resume. It really is about your description of how this program would be meaningful to you at this stage of life. And there are really two things that are at work in that selection. The first is how much you would get out of it based on Russ and Stephanie's reading of your material. And the second is how much you would add to the other 23 members of this cohort. Because what we heard in the first cohort was that while Russ and Stephanie were beloved, people found the greatest value being in community with 23 others that were at this meaningful inflection point and thinking about it with different lenses. And so there is a competitive selection process, but it is not on the quote unquote traditional criteria. It really is about how you're able to describe what you're seeking in this next chapter and how this program could be helpful to it. So we really encourage you to think about and reflect on that essay as you come into this process. Uh, and with that, um, I will just say those are due next Thursday, next Wednesday, February 21st. So they're coming up soon. Um, and in the follow-up email, we'll make sure to include that information. But I'm aware that we have about 10 minutes for questions, so I'm going to move us there. And I've been collecting them throughout this information session. And um, one that I think is just a fun one to get started with, we were asked in the chat to share a provocative reading example. Uh, Russ and Stephanie, can each of you maybe choose one reading that you think fills uh, the description of provocative on your syllabus? Russ? So there's one of the readings, which is very short, but very powerful, is a, a woman who um, worked in a hospice um, called, it's Five Regrets Before Dying. And it's really, she talked to people who were in hospice about what were the things that they wish they had done. Um, and one of the things we challenge people to do is to change um, re regrets to opportunities to say, look, you know, you have an opportunity to do the things that really matter to you. And so I think that's a particularly provocative uh, re reading and interesting discussion. Yeah. Stephanie, so, anything to add? Uh, I really love the growth mindset by Carol Dweck uh, because um, it's helping people to look at what isn't working. Uh, what we can't do, oh no, it's going to fail, I better never try this because it's not going to work, to really looking at an opportunity to put ourselves out there a little bit more and to learn from experiences that it's not just the outcome of what you're doing, it's the process of getting there where the real learning takes place. So we got a lot of questions at a similar intersection, essentially, who is this for and how would you describe an individual? We have a little bit of language that, you know, these are 
individuals who are kind of coming up to this inflection point, uh, but maybe you can give a little bit more in terms of who you saw in the first cohort to give you know the answer by way of example, and then how you would describe who can benefit most from crafting. Ross? So I think, you know, at the very simplest level, it's, you know, the target folks who are in that second half of life, 50 plus, they may be working full time um, or not. Um, they may be, you know, the range in the class was from late 40s to 80. Um, so there was a lot of range in that regard. Um, I think the most fundamental um, criteria is really people who are in a place where they want to go through this kind of um, self-reflective process as part of a community, right? And so I think, you know, there's some folks who say, this is great. You know, I just don't have the time to make the space to be able to do this work. Or, you know, there's some people who are not necessarily um, comfortable um, in, on that community dimension, um, may want individual coaching or whatever else. But I think it truly is for people who are saying, you know, gosh, the traditional model, you know, um, of simply I'm going to work doing what I'm doing and then I'm going to retire in the traditional way. That just doesn't work for me. And I'm trying to craft something different. I'm not quite sure what it is. But I'd really like some space to do that. And I'd actually like some people to keep me honest in doing that and, and support me in that. I think that's the target audience. And what we found is there's such a wonderfully diverse range of people, um, different nationalities and parts of the country and professions and so on, but all of whom are struggling with that in different ways. And that's the joy of the program is, is essentially all of us figuring it out together, including Stephanie and I are still figuring it out, you know, as... <laughs> part of the team. Steph, what would you add? Yeah, I, I think, so this is not a class where you sit in the in the back row and uh, you kind of just listen to, to Dr. Eisenstadt. You, it really is action learning in a participative class and you really have to feel comfortable in a group um, and be comfortable with learning about people who might come from different histories, backgrounds, experiences, um, and bringing up a pretty pretty interesting and provocative issues to uh, discuss discuss and respect. So I think it's the it's the power of the group. And if you really enjoy that, um, then you will you will enjoy the course. Well, so we have a couple questions about what people noticed, which were individual coaching sessions. Can you just talk a little bit about what those look like with both of you? Yeah, Ross. So we have two two coaching sessions. One is, you know, as Stephanie said, it's really important. You know, you're, you're going to be doing a lot of important work in your life. And so we want this to be a really intimate and personalized experience. And so we have one session, one-on-one -on -one session with either Stephanie or I early on in the course to really better understand what you're hoping to accomplish and what are the issues that you're grappling with so that we can help you to think through how to get the most of the course. And then we switch, right? Because Steph and I, but each of us have our own perspectives. We're a great team. And so um, I'll do have talked to 12 folks in the beginning and Steph will talk to the other 12 folks. And then towards the end of the course, we have a second session and that's really about, okay, so you've gone through some of this you know, your life doesn't end at the end of the program. It's just starting. We talk about that as commencement. So that's an opportunity to really um, to think about how do you take the work you've done in the program and bring it, take it forward from there. Uh, so that's that's what those programs are. But we also very much have an open door policy. So if people you know want to send us an email or say in the middle of the course, geez, Russ or Stephanie, we'd really I'd love to chat about X, Y, and Z. That's terrific as well. So those are the two formal programs uh, opportunities. But but again, the whole notion is to really create an opportunity for people to be um, get the support that they they need um, through this period. Yeah, and I, we have yeah. we have um, different backgrounds, Russ and I, and so as we're talking to you, you know, as the, as questions come up, we can easily, uh, you know, have more com more conversations in between, depending upon, you know, if you need more of Russ's background or or my own. I know we are um, coming to time. Uh, we have um, a question about time commitment. 
how much time should we expect to commit to this outside of class? Mm -hmm. Ross? So um, there's, so after each, each session, so the, the session, the class meets every other week. Um, and so if you think about in that two week period, uh, there'll typically be one or two kind of key exercises. You know, we gave you examples of those, uh, the compass exercise or the the uh, querying the underbrush or examples of the kinds of exercises. All of those exercises, by the way, are part of a, a detailed course guidebook uh, that you get in the course that you can you fill out and you can keep and continue to drive. Uh, there's a reading, you know, a, a, a chapter or two or an article or two that you may want to look at. Um, or, or that we would suggest that you look out to really complement things. Um, and then um, after uh, a couple of sessions, we create what we call progress partner groups, which are peer groups of um, folks who get together uh, for an hour um, virtually once every couple of weeks um, and, and have an opportunity to support each other. And so, you know, I think all in all, it's probably a couple of hours um, of, of, of work between sessions, maybe two to three. Uh, I think what people find is it's incredibly energizing, especially the, you know, the progress partners are really one of the highlights of the course. And so people spend more, you know, more time in terms of doing that, but that's sort of roughly what's involved. Um, a final question here comes from Cecile. The whole emphasis on leadership sounds more like work, work, work. How about one's human and spiritual life? I know you have an answer to this one, so I want to make sure you can share how it is well beyond work, uh, but I'll let you do the talking here. No, absolutely. And bravo, right? I mean, so that's the whole point of the fact that the compass is, you know, there's an awful lot there and creating the opportunity for people to have some fun in their life actually to talk about some of the spiritual dimensions of their life um, is really one of the richest parts of the course is to, is to really think about your life as a whole in a way that's balanced. And that's truly, I think, the opportunity um, that we all have in this stage in life is, is, is in fact, um, to, to create, you know, to create life and, and, and live it in the round. Um, so bravo for that, that question, because it's right on target. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion with you both, and we are incredibly grateful to have you at the Graham School teaching and building this incredible cohort and crafting your next chapter. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this hour. Uh, we will follow up with the video. We'll include information on the application process. And uh, to those of you who do decide to apply and join uh, the cohort, uh, please know that uh, we are excited to be your partners in designing the next chapter of your lives. Um, have good afternoons, everyone. Thank you.